Good morning and welcome to Vertical Church Online. Come inside with us as we learn how to never underestimate the power of God to move heaven and earth for us. Amen. Welcome to Christmas in Ovilla, Christmas at Vertical. It's a good time to be together. Amen. It is. This is the week right here. We've been thinking about what it means to be Christmas present, to be present in the moment. Boy, there's so many moments that happen during this time of year. You know, life is full of special moments, but it's during this season when some of the most special happen. And it's the reason why we should do our best to make the most of those moments, to unplug if we have to, detach if we need to, so that we can be fully present in the moment with our family and experience all that God has for us in this season. Amen? You know, God is the God of the moment. I love the fact that he says he is the great I am, present tense. He's the now. He's here. And that we have a promise even in the New Testament. We have the promise that says, where two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus said, I am there. He is right there. He's not just tomorrow. He's not just yesterday. He is all of that. He's the God of eternity. He's the God of all righteousness. He's the God of all wisdom, the God of all power. But he is the God who is right here, right now. Whatever's going on in your life, he is right here in this moment with you in it. You don't have to live in the past regrets. You don't have to live in fear of the future. You don't have to have your mind racing about, I wonder what other people are thinking about me. You can be in this moment right here, right now, meeting with him because he is the God who is here. He is in this moment. He is in your present, which gives us all the more reason to be present. Amen? Because he is present, he gives us the motivation to be present, to be in the moment, not distracted. Not somewhere else in our head, not somewhere else in our thoughts, not somewhere else in fears of the future. He is the God who is here. And the more, the more that you and I will be willing to live in this moment right now, the more you will experience of his greatness and power. Because that's where he works. He works in the now. And for those who will trust him in the now, who will be present in the now, in this moment, fully engaged. God, I'm here. I'm listening. I'm fully wrapped into what you're doing in my life and what you're saying right now. I want it here. To those, God shows up in power and majesty. Our message today is called Never Underestimate the Power of God to Move Heaven and Earth for You. So uh, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2 today. It's the Christmas story. I have a Bible here this with me this morning. I usually have, you know, written out or I'm following the screen or sometimes I use my phone, but I'm using a a page Bible. This one on the front says Lucille V. Treadaway. It's my mom's, my mom's Bible. So this morning, I'm in Luke chapter two for the Christmas story. And it came to pass in those days I want to say that one more time. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Mm. Can you imagine if... All of a sudden, a decree came out, and we all had to travel back to the city where we were born so that we could pay our taxes. That would change the holidays. This is what's happening. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with his or with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. 
And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Beautiful Christmas story. We covered in 16 verses what took a lot of time, a lot of strength, a lot of struggle in reality. And I want us to think about that this morning. I want us to think about the beginning of the story there in verse 1. It came to pass in those days. You know, we see a phrase like this, and it's easy to to stop and think, okay, so they mean like, you know, life was going on. You know, things were happening. People were doing their routines. People were going about their business. A series of events occurred. Some, Some things were unfolding, and it all happened. It just happened. It's a funny phrase we use sometimes. It happened. It happened. The stuff just happens. I don't have any control over it. It just happens. When you get into that way of thinking, we start thinking about life, and we think, yeah, you know, that those uh, people I ran into at the store, yeah, it just happened that I ran into them, you know, or, or that friend that contacted me online, it just, it just happened to see me there. You know, or that raise you got at work, it just happened, you know, it's just, just one of those things, you know, or, or that struggle I was going through, it's just one of those things, it just happens. We start thinking that life is this series of, it just happens, it just, it kind of unfolded, it just, it just came to be next, it just, we were just lucky, we sometimes say, or we were unlucky, we sometimes say, or we say, I was just a weird coincidence. I was just, you know, me, them, right there. That's crazy, crazy coincidence. Who would have thought that that kind of thing would have happened? It just really, you know, it was just so random. Or we might even attribute some things to karma. Let me assure you, God does not use or need luck, unluck, coincidences, random, or karma. In fact, None of those things does he use. And none of those things, listen to me, are true. There is nothing random. There's not. It may look random to you and I, but that's because we don't know all of God's thoughts in mind. It may look coincidental to you. There is absolutely nothing coincidental. It may look like it was just, it just happened I promise you, it did not. And it may look like karma, but let me assure you, there is no such thing. And you say, oh yeah, well, I've seen it. I've seen people do things, and they got what was coming to them. Okay. And you say, well, I've I've done some things, and I've seen what came back to me. Well, then how do you deal with this? While you were dead in your sins, God sent his son, Jesus, to be your savior. He showed you grace when you deserved grace. Death. How are you going to deal with that? There is no such thing as karma. There is no need to knock on wood. There is no need to make sure you don't step on a crack and break your mother's back. There is no need to fear a black cat crossing the street. There is no need to fear walking under a ladder unless someone's painting on top of it. All that stuff, all that superstition, all that stuff is really 
anti-faith. It really is. It's a way of saying, well, stuff just happens. No, it doesn't. God rules and reigns over all things. He is sovereign. If it happens, he had his hand in it. If it happened, he planned it. If it happened, he designed it. If there was something that just happened apart from him causing it to happen, then what happened is bigger than God. And that ain't happening. I like that. I like that. You see, faith says, I don't need all that stuff. Faith says, I believe God is Lord over all. I believe there's no such thing as random. That's what faith says. Faith said there is a holy purpose for all things. Faith says that I believe what God says is true, even when in the moment I can't see it all coming to pass yet. This is what faith does. Faith is bigger than the moment. Faith doesn't need luck. Faith doesn't need a wooden nickel. Faith doesn't need any kind of those kind of things because faith trusts exactly what God says. And faith says God is good in spite of what's happening in the moment. Faith says, I might have lost my job. I might have some broken relationships. I might be struggling, but I still believe my God is good. That's what faith says. Faith says it doesn't matter what circumstances have happened to me. I still believe God is wise. God is powerful. And he is the one that I should seek. That's what faith says, and that's what faith does. Faith believes that God can move and arrange and do, as the Scripture says, exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or think. That's what faith believes. Faith believes that God can and will move mountains when we believe. Faith believes that God will move heaven and earth to accomplish what he has set out to do. That's right. Amen. That's what faith says. The Christmas story, the story I just read, the story that we are all a part of has nothing random to it. There's no karma in it. There's no superstition in it. There's no luck. There's no weird turn of events. And there's no, it just happened. When the scripture says it came to pass, the scripture means in the way that God designed it precisely, exactly, profoundly to happen, it did. It did. So I want us to think about that today, how that happens. You know, Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection was all foretold in the Old Testament. It was prophesied. In other words, God put it into the minds and hearts of other people to write down what he was going to do. And often with great specifics. And so when Jesus was born, lived, died, resurrected, returned to heaven, he fulfilled over 300 of those prophecies. 300 plus written by people in other places, at other times, directed by God. They wrote those down, and Jesus fulfilled every one of them because that is what God had intended, designed, planned, and caused to happen. He moved heaven and earth to fulfill everything that he said he would do. When we come down to just his birth specifically, I want us to think about four of those prophecies. So a man named Micah, who was a prophet in the Old Testament, wrote, moved by God, some 700 years earlier, 700 years, just try to let that sink into your mind for just a moment. 700 years earlier, a man would write, moved by God to write that there would be a savior and he would be born, he would come to earth and be born in a very specific location, Bethlehem. Of all places on the planet, God moves him to write that and Jesus fulfills it. That is where he is born. God moves heaven and earth for that to happen. Almost 800 years earlier, 
from the time Jesus was born, Isaiah would write and say that the Savior would be born from a virgin. Miraculous. Unheard of. Hard to imagine and believe. 800 years by someone else writes these words, moved by God, and when Jesus is born, he fulfills it precisely to the letter. It happens exactly because God will move heaven and earth to see that his purposes are accomplished. Amen? Samuel would write in the Old Testament that a Savior would come through the line of David, that this Savior would not just be born in Bethlehem, not just by a virgin, but here is the family line he will come through. And he does. The prophet Hosea writes that when he is born, that he would then have to leave Bethlehem and travel into Egypt. And he does. Those are just four of the prophecies that Jesus precisely, perfectly fulfilled. God arranged for all of those to happen in just the way they did. And you think about how that happened. Four, those are just four different writers from four different time periods, writing from different places about different aspects of who Jesus is, completely out of the control of anybody. Jesus, as a baby, wasn't making those things happen. Mary and Joseph couldn't force those things to happen. God alone moved to cause his will to be done in exactly, precisely the way he wanted it. And he moved heaven and earth to make that happen. You think about some of the things that it, would, that it did require. So Caesar Augustus is ruling at the time. A man who is not a man of faith. A man who is uh, faithless, cruel, mean. And he is moved to require everyone in the nation to be taxed. And this tax is going to mean that everybody has to leave where they are to go back to where they came from, to their hometown, so that they can be registered there, so that those who were from Rome could be signed up for military service, and so that their taxes could be exacted from them. And if you just look at the storyline from an earthly perspective, you think, wow, that guy was powerful. He just made a decision that affected the lives of countless people, made them uproot themselves, made them go to their hometown, made them all travel, made them have to save, made them have to spend, made them have to sacrifice. One man did that. And you think, wow, he's so mean. He's so cruel. How could he do that? So many people had to disrupt their lives. Didn't he know that Mary and Joseph, didn't he know that she was pregnant at the time, how hard this trip was going to be? Let me assure you, there is no government leader today who is not making a decision that is not at first somehow run by God first. Amen. It's true. If we're going to believe in the sovereignty of God... He's got to be sovereign over all. Okay? So Caesar Augustus makes a plan, and God is the one who's behind the scenes orchestrating it because Mary and Joseph need to get to Bethlehem, and they weren't going to get there on their own. And so God orchestrates for Caesar Augustus to issue a decree that all in the realm should be taxed, and they get up and go. Whew. It kind of gives a different light about circumstances, really. You know, you and I, we want to get upset sometimes when the supervisor, the boss, the authority, the person, whoever it is in whatever realm of authority you have in your life, when they make a decision that you don't agree with, you want to get upset in that moment. But see, you and I are people of faith, and there's nothing random, there's nothing coincidental, there's nothing that, have, that has people in ultimate control of our lives. God is God. 
That's right. Hey, this is just one dimension, Caesar Augustus. You see, God calls all of these people to get up from their places and go and follow. They didn't revolt. They didn't rebel. They got up and they went. They went and they traveled as a nation. A nation gets up and moves. You talk about a highway system with terrible traffic. Everybody's getting up and moving and it's slow. No one's driving Teslas in this day. They're all riding on their donkeys and camels and sheep and walking. And it's just like, wow, this is taking days and days. They are moving and they're going there. And it's the time when Mary and Joseph are pregnant. Really? Does it have to be now? I don't know if Mary and Joseph, you know, thought, really? Now? Couldn't it have been six months ago, a year ago? Couldn't it somehow? No, because Mary... You wouldn't have gone six months ago, a year ago, because you weren't betrothed. You weren't married at the time. You wouldn't have gone there. God arranged the circumstances to get them where they needed to go. God moved the crowds even into Bethlehem, one of the cities. God moved all the people who went there. God moved in such a way that the inn would be filled, that there would be no room. God orchestrated that. There was no need to stand outside the, the inn and say, what is in the world? How does this happen? I can't believe this is happening to me. Don't they know who I... No. God is the one who orchestrates. God is the one who moves. God is the one who will move heaven and earth to see that his will is accomplished. Amen? So he moves and he puts a crowd in Bethlehem. He moves and there's no room for them in the inn. He moves in such a way that there is a place with the animals for Mary and Joseph to go. He moves in such a way that Mary goes into labor at the exact precise time she needed to. Not on the trip, not on the way, not later, but when they arrive in Bethlehem. And if you've been around babies being born, there is no way of knowing when a woman will go into labor. You can, you can chart it, you can count it, you can measure it. God alone knows the day when labor will begin and when that baby will be born. And here God moves for her to go into labor at the exact time. God moves the stars to be in the placement that they are in that night so that they will be ready to be seen by others. God orchestrates the weather that night so that when the shepherds hear the announcement from the angel and they look up into the sky, it's not pouring down rain. There are angels in the sky announcing and declaring God orchestrates, God arranges, God moves, and he moves heaven and earth to accomplish his will. God moved in the lives of faithless people at the time. God moved in the life of godless leaders. God moved in governmental structures. God moved in the masses of the people. God moved the stars. God moves an entire world filled with all kinds of circumstances for it to be exactly what was needed on that day, on that night for Mary and Joseph so that Jesus would be born. I love what it says in Galatians. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, at the perfect time, at the right time, at just the right time. So when the Bible says it came to pass, it was nothing random. It was nothing coincidental. It was all under the sovereign hand of God because God always will move heaven and earth to fulfill his will. I saw um, in a book called Science Speaks, written from a faith perspective about um, circumstances in the Bible, he wrote about this one event in particular. And this man in the book took eight prophecies about Jesus' birth. And he set out to provide some type of um, statistical analysis about the probability of this actually occurring. 
taking eight prophecies written over time by different people about this event and the probability that they would all come to pass exactly as they had been prophesied. And the man said, in order to grasp the weight of that kind of probability, he said, it would be like this. He said, I want you to imagine that you took a silver dollar. You don't see many of these around anymore. A silver dollar, a coin, young people, that's worth a dollar. How about that? That's amazing. A coin worth a dollar. You don't see these around much. Just imagine silver dollars, and now imagine the state of Texas all the way from Corpus Christi, Amarillo, Texarkana, El Paso, Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, you name it, every part of the state of Texas filled on the ground with silver dollars. Just imagine the number of silver dollars it would take to fill the state of Texas all laying down like that. And now imagine not just one level, but imagine them two feet deep. So, you know, something like this. The state of Texas filled with silver dollars two feet deep. That's a lot of silver dollars. Now, imagine that you marked one of them and you tossed it out somehow, somewhere into the middle, somewhere you choose, you find the place and you put one, one marked silver dollar in the the mass of silver dollars. I don't know where you pick. I don't know if you end up somewhere near Sherman. I don't know if you end up somewhere down in the Big Bend region. I don't know where you end up, but you place it there. And I don't know whether you put it six inches deep, 20 inches deep, or you put it off in the corner somewhere of Texarkana. I don't know where you put it, but let's say you put it there. And then you've got a friend, and you said, hey, I put a silver dollar out there that's marked somewhere. I'm going to blindfold you, and I want you to pick some place somewhere in Texas where you think it is, and I want you to go there, find it. Ready? Go. The probability of your friend blindfolded finding that one silver dollar that you marked This gentleman said in his book, Science Speaks, he said, is the equivalent of one in 10 to the 17th power. That's the odds of that happening. There's the number. It's a big number. One out of that. That's your chances. In other words, you'd have to do it that many times before you possibly would find the one that had been marked. This man said that the probability of someone being born and fulfilling all of the prophecy exactly as it was penned has these odds. Now, the thing I love about that is God loves these kind of odds because it's with these kind of odds that he loves to do his best work. It's with these kind of odds that he does what astounds people. In fact, he really likes it different than this. He likes it when the odds are impossible, that it's not going to happen. This makes that look good. This looks good up against impossible. I'd take this over impossible. But God loves impossible odds. God loves to do what is exceedingly and abundantly beyond what we could ask or think. God loves to fulfill his promises when they seem impossible. This is the kind of stuff God loves to do. So when Jesus is born exactly according to the prophecies, 
Jesus, uh, God the Father at the end doesn't say, whoo, man, made it. Oh, man, it was close. I wasn't sure I was going to get him to Bethlehem. I, I, mean, I just wouldn't. I wasn't sure about those swaddling cloth. I just wasn't sure how that was all going to play. No, God knew exactly what he was doing. He will always move heaven and earth to accomplish what he has set out to do. Right. Never <laughs> underestimate the power of God to move heaven and earth to accomplish his will. Now, I recognize that we're sitting here today and we look at this story and you might be thinking this. That all is amazing. That is really, really great. I just know God loves to do that for people like Mary and Joseph. For people like a Moses, a Noah, a Apostle Paul, Jesus. He would love to do that for them. But you see, I'm not any of them. And I don't know that he would still work in that way for me today. I'm not sure I'm in that category. I'm not sure I'm in that Arena. I'm not sure he would do that for me. Well, I want to encourage you this morning with a few things. I want us to all come away from the Christmas story a little changed today. Because this story is not just about Jesus. Look at this from 1 Peter. He, Jesus, indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. It gets very specific all of a sudden. You. All of these odds, all of these promises, all of God arranging what he arranged, all of the design, all of the planning, all of the work was not just for Jesus to be born in that moment. All of that was done, the Bible says here, for you. This is not generic. This is not just some superfluous group out there. This is very specific to each one of us this morning. For you. Jesus was sent for you. Jesus was designed to come for you. It gets very personal. It gets very intense. And this is where you want to be all up in this moment and fully present because this is for you. Yes. Amen. So on that day, on that night, throughout that season, when God is shaping and orchestrating, when he's moving Caesar Augustus, when he's moving the people, when he's causing the end to be filled, when he's causing the stars to be aligned, when he arranges all of that night, he was arranging for you. Oh, man. Ooh, Ooh, come on. Man. It puts you and I right there in the story. We're not separated from it. We're not just removed from it like it's some book that we're looking at from afar. We are all up in this story because the reason he came was for you. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you Jesus. And he did move heaven and earth on that day just for you. Now I know what you might be thinking. You might be thinking like I would think sometimes, well, that's all really awesome. That was all back in the Bible. That's really cool that that happened. I love that we're reading that today. That's really cool that all of that happened then. Let me remind you of another truth. The God that we serve is an unchanging God. And the God that he was then is the God that he is today, is the God that he'll be tomorrow. He is an unchanging God. And what he does then, he'll still do today and he'll still do tomorrow because he doesn't change. And so when he did it then, when he did it then, when he sent his son then so that you could be free from your guilt, so that you could know peace, so that you could have your sins erased from your life, so that you could know real life, so that you could have hope. When he did it then, he was putting in place a promise. He was saying, I'll do it then and I'll do it again. I'll do it then and I'll do it now. 
I showed up in an impossible situation then, and I'll show up in an impossible situation now. He'll move then, and he'll move again, and again, and again, and again. He orchestrated the events of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension. He did all of that, and it wasn't just for the Bible's sake. It wasn't just for some old story's sake. It wasn't just so you could have some compartment of your life settled. He did it so that you would be completely transformed, altered, and never be what you were before. And in the same way that he arranges circumstances for Mary and Joseph, oh, he is arranging circumstances for you today. Mm. See, this is where you and I have to choose to live by faith and not by sight. Because it's easy to look at our circumstances. It's easy to look at the people around us. It's easy to look at that person you're married to, those children you had, that boss you serve, that circumstance you're in, the nation you're in, the government we have, the circumstances going on. It's easy to look at all of that and discount what you will, what you choose to, because it doesn't fit your understanding of how life ought to go. Let me assure you, God is God over all. There is no event in your life right now that is not under his sovereign design. Just let that soak in for just a moment. There is no event, set of circumstances, people in your life that is not under his sovereign design right now. You say, well, I don't understand some of the things going on in my life right now. I don't either. You say, but I don't, I don't even like some of the things that are going on in my life right now. I don't either. I'm sure Mary and Joseph didn't plan to travel when she was pregnant. I'm sure they didn't like the difficulty of it along the way. But they trusted the one who had called them, and they walked with faith that he would lead them. And he did. And he provided exactly what they needed. And he moved heaven and earth to make it happen. Mm. He did the same for you. He did the same on the day you were born. He moved heaven and earth for you. You had absolutely nothing to do with the day you were born. Right? You just showed up. There you were. But God placed you specifically where he placed you. You're not an oops. You're not random. You're not karma. You're not a failure. By God's design, he has placed you where you are. He's given you design. And so we trust him in that. He has arranged for you to be free from your sin and your guilt by grace and mercy, not karma. And the day you cried out and received that forgiveness, you were born again. And you really had nothing to do with that birth either, except you just walked into it. He arranged for it. The Spirit moved on you. The seed was planted. And all you did was say, yes, Lord. Boom! And all of a sudden, you're out there. You, you, you're born again. Just as the day you were born, you were born again. You have new life within you. He arranged all of that. He moved heaven and earth for that. He planned for that person who would share the gospel with you. He planned for that moment where you would have a need in your life. He planned for that. He orchestrated that. He moves all of that because God always moves heaven and earth for those that will trust him. Now, watch this. He moved heaven and earth for you before you trusted him. Oh, yeah, come on. He did. Yes. You didn't have anything to do with your birth. And he arranged all the circumstances to do with your spiritual rebirth, too. Yes. And he does that. You had nothing to do with those. He arranged it. Now, mm. if, if he did it, 
while you were unaware, while you were going your own way, doing your own thing, wandering away, if he did it then, if he moved heaven and earth so that you could know life, then, how much more will he do it for those who have chosen to believe now? Yes. If you need some scripture to back that up, Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Amen. Look. You and I like to get caught up in our worries, our fears, our concerns. We like to get all caught up in that stuff. But when you do that, you're not exercising your faith. You're trying to figure out life on your own. And God says, you're going to have to trust me. I've showed you once how much I loved you. I showed you once how much I love you by moving heaven and earth so that you could know my love. And if I did it once, I'll do it again. And I'll show you again and again and again how much I love you. God is looking for those today who will believe him, who will trust him. I'm confident that Mary and Joseph did. I love 2 Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the whole earth to show himself strong for those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. Do you want to see God move in your life today in a way that is powerful, that is overwhelming, that is 10 to the 17th power odds? I do. I know you do. I know you want to see him work in your family. I know you want to see him work in your circumstances. I know you want to see him work in bigger ways beyond those. He does too. And he is moving. And when one person chooses to believe, he rushes to their side and says, here I come. I'm coming to work. I'm coming to move. Will you trust me? Will you believe me? I will. I'll supersede your circumstances. I'll change what you think is unchangeable. I'll move where you didn't think it was even possible that there could be movement. And it comes for those who are wholeheartedly trusting wholeheartedly believing who are fully in the moment trusting God. When you're in that spot, never underestimate the power of God to move heaven and earth for you. And bow your heads with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we are overjoyed today at the power that is you. Your scale, your massive wisdom and greatness and power to accomplish exactly what you set out to do. And then you invite us, sinners, those who deserve something very different, you invite us to experience grace, favor untold, forgiveness beyond what we could imagine. And then you promise to be there in the moment. I thank you that though this room is filled with so many different people in a variety of different circumstances, each one different from the next, each one in need of trusting you, each one with its own set of 
limitations, boundaries, and what may seem impossible. I thank you that those are the places you want to show yourself the most strong. And I thank you that you give us the gift of faith to be able to trust you in those circumstances. So, Father, fully present in this moment, because you are here, we say to you, we trust you. We trust you now, and we'll trust you in the next moment, and the next moment, and the next moment, whatever they may be. Because you are God and you are good. We can't wait to see what you're going to do in the lives of those who trust you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow, what a great Sunday as we learned that God will move heaven and earth for those who believe. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.